Good evening and welcome to this special post-debate edition of Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Tonight's debate featured candidates for the office of vice president. It's a high-profile position and tonight we saw some high-profile debate. Let me say first and foremost that uh, uh, Senator you and Hillary Clinton would know a lot about an insult-driven campaign. It really is remarkable. At a, at a time when literally, in, in the wake of Hillary Clinton's tenure as Secretary of State, where she was the architect of the Obama administration's foreign policy, we see entire portions of the world, particularly the wider Middle East, literally spinning out of control. The Clinton Foundation accepting contributions from foreign governments You, and you are Donald Trump, uh, Trump's apprentice. Uh, uh, let, let me talk about this Senator, issue I think of the, of I think the state I'm still of the world. On my time. Well, I think, are, isn't this a discussion? This is our yeah. open discussion. Senator, let, let's talk well, about the, well, the state uh, of let the let world. Governor, let me interrupt you, you, let me interrupt you no. and finish my sentence if I can. Finish the Clinton Foundation accepts. As I mentioned, it's a high-profile position, and it's changed over the years in terms of power and prestige. Here now to talk about the role and history of American Vice Presidents is Brooke Simpson, presidential historian and ASU Foundation professor of history. And also joining us is constitutional expert Robert McWhorter. Good to have you both here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Um, what is the role of the vice president? We should say that tonight's debate was spirited. We just saw um, one of the many times that, that the candidates interrupted each other. Um, but let's not forget, they're vying to be vice president, not president. What's the role of the VP? Well, of course, first, the role of the vice president is to be in wait in case something happens to the president, that that person is, as they say, a heartbeat away uh, from uh, the Oval Office. Our vice president also is supposed to be an extended arm of the president, a, the cheerleader in chief, if you will, at the same time. That vice president is supposed to help carry out what the president wants to have done. I mean, we should say that we heard a lot tonight about the presidential candidates by way of these vice presidential candidates, sometimes championing their person, other times throwing darts and arrows at the other guy's, uh, other guy's running mate. The history of the vice presidency, is this the way it's always been? Oh, no. Oh, no. When it was first written, usually what originally happened is when you'd have an election, the guy who got the most votes became president and the guy who got the second most votes became vice president. Well, that didn't make for very happy relationships because they were tend to be of opposite parties. They didn't like each other. You ended up with John Adams stuck with Thomas Jefferson, totally different parties who went at it against each other four years later. Um, so that's what brought about the 12th Amendment, which then totally changed the way the selection of presidents were done. Uh, and so that, that's what happened. Um, for instance, the Electoral College was all wrapped in this. The Electoral College, um, each elector still has two votes. Now, the original reason for that was you wanted to give each elector the chance to vote for somebody in their own state, but they were required to vote for somebody from another state to make sure that you wouldn't have 13 different people getting the same number of votes to I be see. president. I see. So they created this system, and then that filtered down then to the vice presidents, and, and that's why it had to be changed. You know, we talked about how the vice presidents now, as you mentioned, basically at the hip of their running mate. Has it always been like that? Have we had vice presidents who just couldn't stand their, their ticket mate? Well, well, for example, the example of John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson. Uh, Jefferson went back to Monticello and uh, orchestrated a campaign for four years to upset John Adams. Um, it, it wasn't good to be an Adams because down the road, John Quincy Adams had his vice president, John C. Calhoun, openly sabotaging his presidency as well. So sometimes these people do not get along very well. Uh, I think I could spend, John C. Callan is a good example because he's one of the few vice presidents that served under Quincy Adams, also under uh, Andrew Jackson. Jackson wanted to try him for treason and hang him. Goodness and, gracious. Oh, yeah. Now, John C. Calhoun then resigned. He was the first vice president to resign. And he decided, hey, I have more power in the Senate than I will being vice president. So he went to that. So when did it change to where these people were really a team? Well, Probably in 1940, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, for the first time, was able to pick his running mate. And that's because he exercised so much power in the Democratic Party at that time uh, and was going for, what, his fifth term, mm -hmm. I think, at that point. Before, it was usually the conventions a after a certain point. Uh, the president would be elected by the conventions or, or proposed by the conventions, and the party bosses would give it to kind of make other members of the party happy, and they ended up with a vice presidential person until Franklin Delano Roosevelt really started the idea of a ticket and the, the, right. the top of the ticket picking 
the running mate. As far as power, prestige, these sorts of things, did we see changes? It seems like later, it seems like the more we go on, I mean, Dick Cheney seems like he's at the apex of vice presidential power. You've got the Dan Quayles of the world and others who may not be quite so high at all. Um, how is this changing? What's the dynamic here? I think, I think you can highlight, starting with uh, Jimmy Carter's administration, in which uh, President Carter gave Vice President Walter Mondale more responsibility. Uh, that you can see from there that um, Vice Presidents have been given their own tasks. Al Gore was given his own tasks by uh, Bill Clinton. And, and certainly, in the case of uh, George W. Bush, Dick Cheney played an important role in that presidency, uh, maybe to the detriment of the president. But in any case, vice presidents have become important as leaders uh, under um, uh, the president in terms of enforcing the president's policy, focusing on certain things, uh, becoming specialists in their own right. Is this an office of ambition? I mean, why do these people run for this thing? If for so long it wasn't a glamour job, and in some cases it still isn't. Why do people run? You'd actually have to ask them, okay? <laughs> and, 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 and why I, I say that is I, I think uh, some people see this as making them possibly uh, presidential in the future. I don't think Dan, Dan Quayle, for example, imagined himself as being of presidential caliber until other people thought he was vice presidential caliber. I think there are other people who see the vice presidency as a stepping stone of the presidency if they perform well in that office, and so it gives them some exposure. But the office itself is a challenge, and many vice presidents uh, have been very unhappy about it. Uh, John Nance Gardner, who was FDR's vice president for uh, Roosevelt's first two terms, once compared to a warm pitcher, a bucket of spit. Yeah. Oh, well, that's pleasant. Yeah, and by the way, uh, Harry Truman called it about as useful an office as a fifth teat on a cow. Wow. Oh, yeah. So what, what, why are they doing I mean, uh, granted, it's right. changed. It's right. changed. But still, I mean, could, just for that heartbeat from the presidency, is that heartbeat it? Heartbeat from the presidency, at least nine. Oh, in the future, at least nine vice presidents have gone yeah. on to become president. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a good way. Mike Pence's uh, profile and Tim Kaine's profile are greatly enhanced. Did you ever hear of Tim Kaine before today? I mean, really, for a lot of Americans, mm -hmm. some of us political wonks, maybe. But really, these people's uh, uh, profile is much more enhanced. Mike Pence is going to be a uh, contender four years from now, assuming Donald Trump doesn't win. He's going to be, whether he'll win or not, I don't know, but he's, he's going to be a contender, and he never was before, as is as will Tim Kaine. Interesting. As you see the same thing, I mean, this is basically a stepping stone not only to the presidency, if something should happen, God forbid, um, but also uh, as far as your... But then again, you know, uh, the current vice president, he just kind of sat there, and he got the job done, and he's not running for president. But it is one of the most important things a president can do. Um, and we've had cases in which vice presidents have become president, and the result has been a disaster of the republic. Andrew Johnson yep. is a key mm. example. Uh, Abraham Lincoln's biggest mistake, in my mind, was allowing Andrew Johnson to be his running mate. Uh, the nation was set back, no telling how far, by Johnson becoming president. Was he the most damaging vice president in history, do you think? I think so, yes. I, but, I would agree with that. Yeah. And, and, uh, on the other hand, there are cases in which you think you're shelving somebody and then something happens. Theodore Roosevelt, they wanted to get Theodore Roosevelt out of the way, get him out of being governor of New York, made him vice president, all of a sudden he's president of the United States. And on the other hand, you have Spiro Agnew, who was supposed to be, you know, this, this, this big guy from Maryland, and all of a sudden the trouble happens. Trouble happens, and he has to resign, and that led to Gerald Ford being appointed, the first appointed vice president, and then uh, Gerald Ford becomes president, and he takes Nelson Rockefeller, who's the second appointed vice president. Last question, how likely will this office change even more in the future? You know, I think the office may respond uh, to uh, different challenges. Uh, if I can go back real quickly to Dick Cheney. Dick Cheney was interesting. Um, the Constitution is a little unclear where the vice president fits. Most scholars say it's an executive branch function. It's part of the executive branch. Well, historically, it, it, you know, it wasn't part of the administration. They were separate from the administration. Um, Dick Cheney didn't want to fall into executive rules, so he was claiming mm -hmm. that he was a part of the legislative branch because, remember, the vice president is president, pro, uh, president of the Senate. Yes. Now, by the way, his title when he's president of the Senate is Mr. President. So a lot of these guys get used to being called Mr. President, and then they want to extend yeah, it. And Mr. President of the Senate, who doesn't get a vote unless there's a tie. Unless there's a tie. So again, he's just kind right. of sitting around. And he's not allowed to participate in debate either. Yeah, yeah. Right, he's, by he's, statute. There's a lot of sitting around. So what's going to happen yeah, in the future? Absolutely. It's hard to know. I would uh, say there is one other job that the vice president has. There are other um, 
statutory and constitutional jobs they have. But one job is to be rolled out every four years and put on the boxing gloves, and that's what they do. <laughs> and that's, that's what we saw tonight. Gentlemen, yes. good stuff. Good to have you both here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Beside Highway 191 near Clifton is a memorial to 1880s Arizona law and order. Then, as now, the Clifton Cliff Jail is a two-room hole, blasted from solid rock and fitted with iron bars paid for by the owners of Clifton's first copper mine. Local tradition says the jail's first unwilling guest was the local stonemason hired to build it. When he finished the jail, the mason decided to celebrate at Clifton's Hovey Dance Hall, where he downed snakehead whiskey and shot up the place. The dance hall belonged to the deputy sheriff, who rewarded his rowdy patron with a compulsory stay in his own creation. In 1906, a flash flood filled the ground level Bastille with water and mud, forcing the rescue of the prisoners by rope and the jail's closure. Today, it's dry, and visitors are welcome to take an eerie step down and back into Arizona history. Debates are about what's being said by competing candidates, but how those words are delivered and the accompanying body language can be just as telling. For more on this, we welcome Karen Adams, an ASU professor and expert in linguistics, and also with us is body language expert Renata Musso. Good to have you both here on Arizona Horizon. Good Thank to see you, you here. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. What kind of research is done on campaign debates? What's, got, what's out there as far as research is concerned? There is a lot of research done by different groups of people. So there are psychologists who are interested in looking qualitatively at the language that's used. There are communication experts, rhetoricians, and linguists. And we all have slightly different approaches. To and I was going to say, yeah, and, and every campaign, <laughs> you get more stuff, don't you? More, more research. Absolutely, yes. It's getting more interesting by the day. Yeah, I will. Let's, let's start. We're not. Let's start with you and, and body language because I, I know that uh, in a recent debate here, uh, President Clinton uh, did some things and was moving in certain ways. We'll get to both candidates in a second here, but, but take a look at President Clinton here and tell us what you're seeing as far as body language is concerned. Mm -hmm. Now, is is what do you see in there? She seems to be certain of what she's saying. She looks to the audience. She emphasizes correctly with her hands, very positive movements. And she emphasizes with her wrist. All right, so that's a, that's a positive then. We're seeing, yes. we're seeing affirmative positive kinds yes. of things. Yes, definitely. All right, I wanna to go to another one here, and this one I believe is from the debate tonight. And we had a lot of interruptions. We had a lot of you know uh, pushing and shoving here early on. It kind of mellowed out there comparatively speaking, toward the end. <laughs> Let's look at tonight, tonight's debate here and see. What are you seeing here? Well, uh, Mr. Pence is very certain of what he's saying, but very often he makes a very serious face and very tight lips. I noticed also he looked down quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, maybe checking his iPhone. I don't know, but that's how it looked like to me. So basically, if you're looking down for no mm -hmm. other reason than mm -hmm. nervous habit, uh, maybe mm -hmm. looking at your nose, maybe looking at the, the, just anything, if I'm at home and I think you're hiding something, mm -hmm. that's a big deal, isn't it? Right, right, I would think so, yes. But uh, he looked also on occasions, and what I noticed, he constantly shook his head at any statement of uh, Mr. Kane, yes, which is very negative because it makes the other opponent unsure of what he's going to say or unsure of what he just said. But if I'm if if I'm Mike Pence and I'm going mm -hmm. no like that, I'm trying to make the point that this guy is not telling the truth. Am right. I making that point? You definitely do, but you also make the other opponent unsure of himself or herself. Okay, it's very negative. It's negative, but it might yes. work. It does work. Yeah. It does work, usually. Yeah. Okay, yes. one, one last one here, and this is from Donald Trump. He, mm -hmm. he kind of has this way of leaning in this sort right. of business. What, what, what's that all about? Well, um, he holds on to his podium number one yeah. at most of the times. He has the same body language movements, hand movements, if it's positive or negative, which is very unusual because normally people change their movements for positive or negative. So when he does this, this, this kind of leaning in thing, right. when he was doing that sort of mm -hmm. business, what did that mean? That means he's 
before he attacks, that's usually what he does. It's called a shoulder thrust. Oh, interesting. Yes. Loading up then? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> he leans forward before he attacks the opponent. Can we show that Trump one one more time? Is it can we? Because again, it was early on when he was kind of leaning forward, and you were saying when he's doing that, he's ready to, to let attack. Go. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. In that, because yes. he does that a lot. A, a lot, and yeah. he holds on at the podium at the same token. All right, Karen. Uh, as far as linguistics are concerned, uh, words matter. How much do they matter? Well, that's an interesting question, <laughs> and sometimes people argue that actually gestures may on occasion mean more than the actual words that people are using. And of course, if you're already a supporter of a particular candidate, maybe the words that you're hearing from the opposing uh, party candidate don't matter a whole lot. Yeah. So, you know, there are these different kinds of uh, ways of looking at these, but words certainly can make a difference. They create an impression about you as a, as a campaigner, as an opponent. And so there are things that do have impact. From tonight's debate, yes. there was a lot of interrupting going yes. on. I think we have a, a, a cut from this. Let's take a look at this. You okay. tell us what you're hearing. All right. I need to release I need tax to ask returns you about the audit social security. Is over. Richard, Richard, Richard Nixon released about. tax returns when They're he was under audit. They're going to raise your tax bill. Gentlemen, if you can't tax. meet Gentlemen, the Nixon standard, the people standard, at home cannot understand either one of you when you speak over each other. I would please ask you to wait until it is that the other is. All right, uh, we had a lot of that, especially yes. early on. Uh, what's that telling us? Well, I think in this case, these this vice presidential debate is not without context. And so for the presidential, the first presidential debate and for the Republican primaries, one of the things that Donald Trump does a lot is interrupt. And so I think that there was at, at a moment when probably some discussion about, you know, what should be the role of this, of interruption and this kind of repartee and looking as aggressive and as energized as yeah. you get with um, with Donald Trump, for example. It's tricky because in Trump's case, if you looked at the commentary, a lot of people um, have stereotypes about the fact that men interrupt women more than women interrupt men. And so this, so there were a lot of people being very critical about that, and it's an, it's an interesting issue. But when you have someone like Hillary Clinton who has moved into a position that no other woman has really had the opportunity to have, she has learned through experience to use interruption as a turn-taking strategy also. So she did interrupt back. Yeah, yeah, yes. we had, we, yeah. We, yeah they, they happened both times there. Right. Uh, I think we really quickly, can we see Trump interrupting here? It should be too hard to find. You I mean, from that last debate. You proposed an approach that ever. has gave a it that this is our, this billion is dollar tax minutes. benefit for your family. And when you look at what how much, you are how proposing, much for my family? it is, Lester, how as I said, trumped up, trickle down. Okay, trickle so we down. not only got the interruption, we got the lean in. We got the this. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yes. So he was loading up and ready yes. to go. Absolutely. Everything yes. you could want. All right, yes. before we let you guys go, what, what do people, I mean, what do, what do we want in a debate? What do we want to see? Personally, I think for people to be civil and polite, I would really welcome that. And you, but you think most folks would welcome that? I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> okay. what, do you, what do you think? Well, there was a lot of discussion about being presidential. And so, but on the same time, people want entertainment. They're looking for, you know, the kind of entertainment value. And so I think there are conflicting desires that we as the audience have in what, what happens here. Yes, we do want to hear what they're saying. We have expectations of debates that there are going to be equal opportunities to speak. And yet there's a lot recently of debates where the floor is opened up so that people can, in terms of discussion or yes. other kinds of context, so that people can get that kind of entertainment, unmoderated interaction. All right. Well, it's good to have you both here. We learned quite a bit. It's, I can never watch Trump doing this again now without thinking, <laughs> oh, you know what's about to break loose. Good to Thanks. have you both here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very so much. much.
This year's race for the White House has been inundated with hyperbole and misinformation, so much so that facts themselves are being called into question. A number of fact-checking websites are attempting to get the record straight, and here to tell us how that's working out, Kendra Smith of ASU's Morrison Institute of Public Policy, and Jessica Pucci of ASU's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Good to have you both here again. Thanks for joining us. Um, how much fact-checking is going on during these kinds of things? There's a lot. There's a lot of fact-checking going on. Every major news outlet has some form of fact-checking um, that's either live or directly after the debates. Who's visiting these websites? Are, are, is it political junkies? Is it just who, who's doing? Who's who's checking in? Well, the great thing about uh, about social media is that it, anybody can, can check in. Um, and fact checkers are uh, well. First of all, fact checking has been around for a long time, um, and fact checkers are journalists. Um, and now that fact checking has kind of uh, you know entered a renaissance period via you know, new technology and more sophisticated methods, we are actually able to fact check in real time. And so that means fact checkers have really taken to social media to do their fact checking. And so that means people in real time are, are interacting with, with fact checkers. Yeah, but, but, but who's fact checking the fact checkers? I mean, it's gotten to the point now where even during tonight's vice presidential debate, you had one candidate saying, Donald Trump said this, and the other candidate saying, no, he did not. Now, Someone's right and someone's wrong, but even right. the people that are wrong are saying, I'm right. Well, that's the interesting thing about fact-checking because um, it's kind of a self-selecting group who goes to fact-check because even though sometimes people might hear things or they might hear that something is untrue, our emotions and our previous held beliefs kind of take over and they lead us to either um, disbelieve the facts Yes. Yeah. Well, and, and again, especially when everyone's kind of getting their news from sources now uh, that kind of affirm what they believe in the first place. We're seeing much more of that than we used to. Yes. Yeah, so, and what we're also seeing is fact checkers going beyond, you know, a simple true or false. Um, and, and is this number right or is it wrong? Tonight we saw a couple, you know, interesting qualitative fact checks happen. Um, we saw that, you know, at one point Pence said, um, Trump's tax returns showed that he went through a very difficult time, but he used the tax code the way it's supposed to be used. Well, in the middle of the debate, Cain kind of recognized, hey, well, the only reason, you, the only way you could say that is if you had, you yourself had seen the tax returns. And he said, hey, how do you know that? Well, that was a two second portion of the debate, yes. but fact checkers picked up on that and they started reporting on that right away. Some of the big fact checking sites, what, what's out there? What, what do people usually go to? Well, of course, factcheck.org, PolitiFact, um, the big news networks are all doing it, um, CBS, ABC, Bloomberg, NPR. Open Secrets is out there too, correct? And is, is, uh, is Snopes still involved with this kind of thing? Um, a bit. I, I actually really enjoy uh, uh, PolitiFact, and I believe we have a few tweets uh, that they shared tonight um, that kind of put you know, candidate statements on a truth meter yeah. um, and rank them, you know, kind of uh, how true is this? Is it half true or is it totally false? So this is politicfact.org, correct? Correct. And this, this one is all the way to the left. That doesn't look very good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there are, there were plenty of, of uh, you know, false hits on, on the truth meter tonight. Um, and, you know, in, in both camps. And so that's really, it, it's a very visual way to communicate the, the truth of the statements that candidates are making. I think we have another one from PolitiFact, do we not? There we go. Uh, yeah, there, uh, yeah, there we go. This one's half true now. Correct. Uh, yeah, both, both candidates made statements tonight about immigration that were either false, false or only half true. And, you know, again, it's very helpful to, to see the visualization of that in, in real time in social media. We also saw, again, some of the nuances where it's not just true or false, but, um, you know, at one point Pence made a remark about, um, you know, Border Patrol in Arizona. And, and um, he remarked that Trump was going to um, increase Border Patrol, and that is true, but actually the, the 2013 bipartisan Senate bill would have increased it even more. And so it's putting the, putting the facts in context. So when you have a, 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 a debate like tonight, the vice presidential debate, and uh, honestly, there seemed like a lot more substance here than the first presidential debate. I mean, they were going after each other on issues and you're right, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're right, this sorts of thing. Does it make sense for a viewer to hit up some of these sites and see what's going on, what's being said? I think so. I think that 
in a perfect world, that's the part of deliberation that we would expect in our informed citizens. And how this all came about comes from a sort of negative place because people have felt like both candidates have not been held to the same um, standard as far as truth telling. But it's a good thing that it's that fact checking has emerged. Yeah, but mm -hmm. it, it, I know Governor Chris Christie was saying that fact checkers have an agenda all their own. Is that valid? Well, as Jessica said, fact checkers traditionally are journalists and they have a high standard of the truth. And, um, and not to involve their, their, their opinion, to not to be deferential in their tone. So um, on that aspect of what Governor Christie said, it's, it's untrue, okay? But that's not to say that since fact checking has become this big thing now to where everybody is involved, that um, networks with an agenda cannot be involved. That's, that could happen. Yeah, and, and, and last question here. I guess the concern is people used to go to certain news sources. They were trusted. Everyone went to the same place. Now everyone, as we mentioned earlier, it's, it's a, there's an echo chamber out there, and it's a concern. Are there echo chambers regarding fact checks? I think there may be, and I think part of what's contributing to that is now the candidates themselves have their own fact checkers. So they have gone out, they have hired experienced journalists to be their own fact checkers. And so, uh, you know, it's a, it's a lot of voices in the fact checking chamber and, and the echo is loud. All right. Very good. Good to have you both here. Thank good you. conversation. We appreciate the uh, information, the facts, just the facts. <laughs> That's it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you for joining us on this special post-debate edition of Arizona Horizon. And we'll be here for analysis after the next presidential town hall and presidential debate. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you.